So thank you for the opportunity uh, of having me as a discussant here. I see a lot of very illustrious faces in the audience and I'm sure we'd all love to hear their thoughts as well. So I'll keep this short. Uh, so thank you to the speakers for giving a really nice overview of where we stand in terms of microeconomics for development. As Carol also started the session that we've been talking about the bigger picture, there have been some thoughts on how with the bigger picture we are, or rather with the focus on smaller analyses, we are uh, maybe losing sight of the bigger picture. And I think that this uh, session sort of really got that all, got all those thoughts together. So I'm just going to keep it um, a bit more general. So I think this is also going back to the idea of synthesis that was that, that Stefan Durkorn talked about two days ago. And I think this has also been raised very nicely by Alan in his uh, opening uh, presentation today. And I think as, a, as somebody who's starting out a career in, um, in academic and policy research, I think that with sort of focusing on the bigger picture, we also, have, we also need to understand what are the mechanisms that make these bigger policies work. So I think that that's where the body of these smaller interventions, whether it's using experimental methods or observational data, we need to get sort of all the analysis together in order to be able to synthesize it, to understand what works, what doesn't, where there are positive results, negative results, before we can really come up with smart policy uh, suggestions. Um, in terms of uh, sort of more specific uh, comments, uh, just from the reading of, of my reading of the literature, I'm not completely convinced that the fact that training has not worked for sort of enterprise performance is a very de decided result yet, given, you know, the sort of shortcomings of the existing literature that, that David and Chris uh, highlight in their 2013 paper. There have been a lot of statistical problems with the papers that have done it largely on account of power in terms of, you know, sample size, uh, the sort of time spans that these studies are considering, attrition issues, reporting bias, and things like that. So I think until we can get a number of really good studies that are mitigating these concerns. We probably shouldn't uh, sort of get to the thing to say that these training programs do not work. Uh, moreover, they also have a recent NBER working paper, which is uh, using a bunch of their own uh, data from previous studies, which actually shows that these uh, management practices that small firms adopt are positively correlated uh, with, with firm performance. So I think that there's a sort of disconnect between what the observational data shows and what the experimental literature has shown. And I think that we need to sort of reconcile that. Um, also, you know, there have been these spate of papers on training programs, whether that's at the more personal level. So we now have a bunch of papers that are looking at these skill, skill building programs, cognitive skills, non-cognitive skills. But I think we still don't understand, uh, you know, what components of the program work and what doesn't. And I think that we probably need more research in order to understand uh, what aspects of these programs are more successful. And we also know from experimental literature in the lab that framing really matters. So we need to keep that into, to take that into account. And a lot of countries, particularly developing countries, are taking up skill building programs, but we need to know what works before they can be advised on how to take this forward. And I think that this also relates to Karen's point about, you know, sort of measurement issues. Um, and just another observation, it seems uh, from, you know, what Alan spoke about and also what, what Chris mentioned is that mitigation of risk appears to be one of the sort of key avenues uh, for helping households as well as firms and farmers to undertake more productive investments. And I think that we need to think more about that, to think about what would in incentivize these people uh, to maybe even invest in these technologies when they have to pay a little price for it, even if it's not the full market price. Um, so these are just uh, a few of my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you once again for uh, being here and uh, thank you for the uh, comments as well. Um, so I'd just like to uh, keep it short and uh, mention a few uh, points that I found uh, exciting in this uh, session and a couple of other sessions as well. And uh, these are things that uh, I would like to uh, work on in the uh, next few years. Uh, so the first one was that I think that we can spend some more time thinking about how field experiments can be used to understand uh, spillover effects. So just as an example, we know that there's a tight two-way relationship between agriculture and health. So interventions in the health domain would have uh, effects in uh, for uh, agricultural outcomes and vice versa. And I think we can still uh, work further on uh, understanding that. Uh, 
And then also from the point of view of uh, availability of uh, data, it's quite uh, exciting to know that there are more uh, uh, carefully collected panel data sets uh, over longer uh, periods of time. So uh, I look forward to thinking more about intergenerational uh, mobility and transmission of uh, various uh, uh, effects. Uh, Finally, uh, going back to more uh, measurement uh, issues, uh, there was some talk uh, yesterday, two days ago in the conflict uh, uh, session as well, that I think we need to move beyond uh, just looking at the uh, incidence of uh, conflict at the level of the household and to more uh, thinking about designing new uh, questionnaires to look at the effect of uh, conflict within the uh, household. Uh, and finally, there's also been a movement towards measuring individual level behavioral and personality traits. I think there's uh, still a lot more work to be done in uh, measuring them uh, better and also uh, understanding the role of aspirations and uh, uh, expectations. All right. So thank you. Um, so we have time for some questions. So I'll do. I'll take uh, maybe three questions, and then we we'll see if we have time for a second round. So I'll start. I'll start at the back here. Yes, my question is more specifically addressed to Jan, but for individual analysis too. Uh, you know, I entirely agree with you that we would like to have longer term effects of RCT studies. Uh, but the question is that it seems that the methodology of RCT is particularly inappropriate for longer term effect due to attrition and due to spillover effect. So isn't it a self-contradictory statement? That's, a, that's what we would like to do, but it's not the proper method because there are very, deep, very specific conditions that we need to be met for the impact to be properly measured. Okay, okay I'll take one from the front. I think uh, Alan's... Uh presentation put the very clear uh, background stories about the development of microeconomics and I entirely agree that the microeconomics uh, economics work had to be put into macro context back when you finish doing micro works and we shouldn't forget um, I mean RCT dominated and it is it brought very good uh, uh, evaluation techniques, but we should understand the development is a long-term process, as uh, Philip mentioned, and uh, it is uh, basically you cannot, uh, you know, really do it RCT in the long, long-term time dimension. So we have to be aware when, whenever you take make. Uh, uh, evaluation and the conclusions not to be too, you know, uh, decisive. But my question is very much to Woodruff. Woodruff, I'm not surprised that microfinance uh, product is not uh, good for scaling from micro to that because it's standardized uh, working capital. <coughs> and basically to get from micro to uh, bigger scaling up enterprises, you need much more farm specific financial product. It's a very financial service, it's very information intensive things. And you cannot do it with a standardized one. So it's not just a grace period, two months, changing it, but much more thinking about it. And in that uh, uh, sense, yeah, I, I will quickly. In that sense, I also I have a question. Training, you mentioned that actually industry specific, sector specific things are more important. So if training is too much general training, I'm not surprised it didn't have effect. But, uh, you know, if it is training which is more geared to that particular sectors they are working, that might make okay, quite I different. Think, so again, think, information is sent. Okay, I think we, we'll take one more before. Um, I think I saw Louise's hand first. <laughs> uh, thank you. I'm Louise Fox from the University of California at Berkeley. I first want to congratulate the panel members. It was um, a terrific, this was a phenomenal panel. This was terrific, really good. Um, I uh, really want to uh, focus a bit on Chris's point, 
uh, Chris's presentation, but I want to pick up on what Alain said about the macro-micro linkages. We used to do something called the micro-foundations of macroeconomics, and it seems maybe we need to go back to that, at least for, for development. And I think if we went back to that, I, Chris, I would rephrase the question that you were answering. Uh, um, what do we know about creating wage employment? That's what your graph said that you put up, is that there isn't enough wage employment. And that was where Santiago Leve left us at the end of the last uh, session. And I think part of the answer is macroeconomic. It's, it's Roderick's work about deindustrialization and the fact that the manufacturing sector is much more capital intensive due to globalization than it was uh, years ago and that the service sector is a sector of smaller firms and, and lower productivity. And um, so that leaves us then, uh, I'm not sure the right question is, can we get self-employed and small enterprises to grow? Uh, and, and I think that when you talk about the marginal returns to capital in small enterprises, it's important to note that most of those grants uh, may have increased profits, uh, but they did not uh, increase employment uh, fantastically. And I think we need to remember that about your whole discussion uh, about uh, self-employment and these graphs and the uh, shortage of capital. Um, and finally, I would like to, uh, and that's the problem with generalizing, by the way, from these uh, RCTs to um, the broader uh, generalizing beyond an RCT, is that giving a grant uh, is fundamentally different than giving a loan. And the people, people's behavior to a grant is fundamentally different than a loan because, I mean, Stiglitz has explained this to us many years ago about uh, people's attitude toward risk. Uh, finally... So if we could wrap up again. Yeah, I'd just like to say on... Um, Chris, I think one question I would pose and maybe add to your agenda. I, do you agree that we have underestimated in survey research on firms? Most of the survey research has been on households and not really on firms. Okay, so I think I'll ask the panel to respond and then we might have time for another round. Yeah, the, the issue of uh, attrition and the kind of short-term, long-term is not specific to RCTs. We are going to, whichever entry point we take, whatever measure we have, whatever way we have used to manage this entry point, we're going to be affected by how do we keep track of the longer term impacts. I think there are interesting ways of combining natural experiments with RCTs. For example, think of an experiment where you do an RCT, a progressor type, right? And then you want to follow the long-term consequences. You're going to have a lot of attrition to follow specific individuals. But maybe you need to project it at a higher unit of analysis at the municipality or at the, at the, at the regional level. So you are going to have a kind of dilution of uh, tracking particular individuals, but they are going to be, of course, there's migration and there's going to be attrition across <coughs> municipalities, if you like. But you can recoup some of those uh, spillover effects and uh, some of those longer term effects by kind of redefining, projecting onto a natural experiment following what you have done at the level of an RCT initially. And then you can do the opposite in terms of what you are proposing, which is, Start with a natural experiment, which allows you to kind of track the broader, longer-term impact. And then it raises issues of design, issues of incidence, which then you take on via specific RCT. So you, you go the other way around. We did, for example, work on the credit bureaus in Guatemala. You, you look at first the rollout and the impact that the credit bureaus have in the general sense, but then it asks very specific questions as to who are the beneficiaries, who are the, who are the ones who are hurt. And then you do maybe an encouragement design, you do, a, you do an RCT. So I think we have to be careful not to put the method before the question. And once we have the question, it eventually suggests ways by which we can reconcile being precise in terms of uh, measuring impact using RCTs, but at the same time, following up the broader implications of what those interventions have using other kinds of data. 
Chris, do you want to? Yeah. So uh, let me uh, let me let me quickly go through a couple of things here. Uh, so first, let me start with uh, Louise's comment. So so fantastic. First of all, uh, I'll point you to the, the pedal website, the program I run for Diffid, where there are four research themes. One of which is micro-founded macro model. So so we are trying to push in that direction. Um, uh, I can think of. You know, a handful of people who are do, I think are doing fantastic work in that area, but it's a very small handful, and I think it's not enough. And and we've had trouble getting good proposals on that theme in particular that I think is 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 particularly challenging. But but I agree with you completely that that's that that's an area. Second, I would say um, I don't think I wanted to say that. Uh, that uh, scaling up microenterprises is the way to move from the top left to the bottom right. Uh, in fact, by bringing up John Sutton's work, I think I'm saying that you know the evidence we have on large firms, a lot of them start large. Um, uh, there's there are other reasons to be interested in profit and and uh, and and income from microenterprises. That's that's tends to be people from the lower half of the income distribution. Even if they don't grow, if you can increase their incomes, there are reasons, there are, there are reasons to think that that might be a good thing. Um, uh, uh, clearly, grants work differently than, 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 uh, than loans. I think that's, again, I think I see this as part of the learning process of trying to understand then what is it we need to do about the loans to make them work more like grants. Uh, and, and I think that's a, that's a, you know, I think the research itself sort of uh, uh, illuminates an area. Now, the other thing I'd say is it illuminates an area. This is this is very much the the the, the stereotypical. Why why are you at, why are you looking there? Because the light that's where the light's better. Uh, you know, we can do we can do our CTs on on micro enterprises. The samples are big. Uh, you know, small grants are enough to 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 get to get a shock. We can't do that very easily on large firms, and I think that's that's a problem. And that's the problem I want to sort of highlight in this that I think the focus has been too much on, on small firms because the methods that have been used have been focused on small firms. We need to think about how we, how we, how we, how we do something in, uh, uh, in, um, in, in, uh, in larger firms. And I think we're making some progress in that area, but it's, it's come later. And, and so I can't point you to a lot of things yet, except things that are, that, that are, that are in progress. Uh, and the last thing I want to say is, um, uh, uh, is, is that, you know, to say that, we also, I think David and I are not saying that training for microenterprises doesn't work. We're saying that we don't know anything, that we haven't learned because of it. And, and again, I guess when I reflect on that, I want to say maybe we haven't learned because this is just the sort of problem that RCTs are not so good at, 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 uh, at solving. But, uh, but, that's, uh, but, but, but perhaps there's, there's a design out there that, 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 would, that would, would actually uh, uh, make more, uh, more progress in that, in that area. Just to um, just to complement what Anna was saying on, on on the long term, so I mean, so I, I completely agree. The kind of the, the the concerns about attrition and general equilibrium are are methodological concerns that can be addressed within an RCT or without. Now it can be costly, uh, and 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 so that kind of requires. And when I mean, in a certain way, the question is more: when do we go, do that extra effort? I think that's one part of the question. And the other one is thinking: if we're interested in the long term. <laughs> We should be thinking about that when we design those studies um, and, and go from there. So when we, when we design the studies and we know we want to know the long term, then there's certain types of information we need. Uh, and the, if the general equilibrium is a concern either on the short or on the long term, we need randomization at a higher level uh, to take that into account. Now, and, and there is a trade-off there between the short term and the long term, potentially, but, but that, that's something that we can consider. Now, the other part, though, I think is, and, and, and this is coming back to the, kind of the part that I skipped over, I think kind of understanding the context and the household decision-making and the theory can also help us understand which parts of the population we expect a long-term impact on. And that then allows to, so in a certain way, going away a little bit from the average treatment effect on the entire population and thinking about, okay, wh where, where should we focus our efforts? Um, and then, because then it becomes easier if, in the sense of if we, if we track the population that is of the highest interest and that's, you know, a, a more defined population, the ones where we have seen short-term impacts, for instance, to kind of, because if there's no short-term impacts, you know, it makes sense that there won't be much long-term impacts, although I guess you can tell a story where that's the case. So I think it's an issue of, of being of, of being more innovative in a certain way. Uh, and, and so that's kind of the, I didn't explain the, the methodology behind the Nicaragua results I presented, but that's kind of what we did. We focused on the cohort that should have had the highest impact based on the dropout rates, et cetera. And then we did a lot of effort to find them no matter where they went. 
and 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 then we and then we use kind of attrition methodology to bound whatever we find subsequently. So, so I, I'm, we started a bit late, so I'm going to take two more just two more questions. Um, John, maybe. And, Yes. Uh, John Rand, University of Copenhagen. It's a question for Chris. Uh, and following up on Louise's uh, comment and uh, referring to the Shea work with the uh, Clino, they also did some work, or he did some work with uh, Ben Alton as well about the missing middle. But I, what I took from that work is actually what you also said now, that we may be focusing a little bit too much also in research on the small and medium scale enterprises. This has led policymakers a little bit to focus their credit schemes on the small and medium scale sector because researchers are doing a lot of effort in documenting that you have big effects of actually granting capital grants to these firms. However, the Shea and Alton work shows that large firms may be more relatively more capital constrained and they are more job creating, as Louisa maybe is, yeah, you referred to. So are we doing something, are we biasing policymakers as well by, by the research that we are doing on focusing on these experiments on the small and medium scale enterprises? Thanks, John. And then one last question over here, if you can make it quick, please. Thank you. I'm from University of Gothenburg. I have a question for Professor Kutrup, very short. Uh, you mentioned about capital, labor, and technology, but uh, as I come through to your work, there's also one more, the surrounding institution of firm may impede their growing bigger because mo moving bigger may become you more visible to the public. And you have done job in, in Vietnam showing that firm relying on, on informal arrangement to set down the contract. And I've done the same research in SME in Vietnam, and I felt that paying more price likely to have, uh, in compulsory industry, likely to have environmental certificate. And this paying bribe firm is also likely to exit through uh, surveying uh, route. So my question is, is this a, a, a venue for more search on why firm cannot grow in big? Yeah. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> uh, missing middle. Uh, uh, so, so the last question is a great question. Or by advising policymakers by focusing too much attention on this. Um, I, I have to say, I think in most contexts, um, the large firm owners are better connected politically and have better access to, to capital than small than small enterprises do. Um, uh, so uh, maybe there's a sense in which we're offsetting. We're off. We're off. We're offsetting that. But but I, but that's 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 not the right answer because because clearly we do need to look at at, at what's happening in large firms as well. You know, this is a place where I, I think there's some there's some work out there. Uh, Esther and Abjit have a paper that's been a working paper forever, and I think now is finally published using changes in policy for sort of slightly larger middle-sized firms in in India that looks at returns to uh, marginal returns to to in capital investments, where set aside programs were changed. The 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 thresholds for set aside programs were changed. It allows them to look at access to capital for larger larger enterprises. That's the kind of stuff we're going to have to do because you're not going to give grants to to, to firms where, where it's hundred thousand you know where it's hundred thousand dollars. It's going to have to be things, uh, things like that. I know several. I tried myself in in uh, in Mexico. Santiago's still gone, but so I tried myself in Mexico. Not 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 uh, Santiago's involved, but but uh, to do uh, something with uh, a, a program on um, uh, credit uh, uh, guarantees that you know. Got, so this is the government spend hundreds of millions of dollars a year in subsidies for large scale firms through uh, through credit guarantees. Uh, large scale, me at least medium, you know, medium size, much larger than the, than the small size. We have no idea whether these work or not, whether it's all inframarginal or whether there's anything that happens at the extensive margin. I tried to put something together in Mexico. I know there's a Antoinette Shore and, and Russell Tassa tried to put something together in, in Indonesia. I think that one's still alive, but, but barely. Um, these are really hard programs to try to to try to assess, uh, and I think we we have to kind of go back to to thinking about how we use the data that's available to answer those those questions. I I, I agree completely. We we shouldn't we shouldn't be ignoring that. I think they're much more challenging, and I think that's where we where we need to move. Um, surrounding institutions, I I also agree completely. I think these the micro enterprises. I worry less about that than I do uh, once firms get to a certain a certain size, and and the the 
the um, the training, the the things that have been done on training, a few of them go to slightly larger firms, and you're going to run into to that. They're going to be constraints from from uh, being visible. They're going to be constraints from running past your uh, known network of suppliers and 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 customers that make it hard to that hard to expand uh, uh, more and so forth. Again, I can point to a couple of things that are ongoing. Dan Kennison has a has a project, uh, a part of his brick project, where he wants to do something that's going to shift the cost curve, that's going to tell us a lot about, about the expansion of firms that are slightly larger and, and what the demand curve for the, at the firm level looks like, which is, I think, one of the big research issues now. Is I can think about industry demand curves, but I want to know about the firm demand curves. I look at a place where there are 100 people doing exactly the same thing. Textbook tells us they all face flat demand curves. They don't. They don't for a variety of reasons, including institutional ones you mentioned. And I think we don't have a good sense of how much friction there is in those markets. And I think we need to we need to think that out. I can think of some projects that are that are ongoing in agricultural markets and are ongoing in you know Dan's work in the in the brick sector and some others that uh, that are that are doing that. But I think that's a that's that's a that's one way to kind of make progress in that in that area. Okay, so I, I'll let Karen and I maybe just sum up in a. And if you have any last comments? I mean, we have been working with large firms. The, you can have access to administrative data. You can work with large banks. Uh, it's a different set of contacts. There are less degrees of freedom, but you have a, a larger database as well. Right? So I think the working style is different, but I don't see why a priori there is such a, an impediment to asking questions about large firms that you could ask about small firms. Okay, so I'm afraid that's all we've time for. So, I mean, I agree that it's been one of a very interesting session and um, we have um, come a long way, but it's a lot, lot further to go in relation to looking at the microeconomics of development. So I'll let you all go to your lunch now and I won't say any more. So thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.